church, let's keep getting ready to worship him today. We're going to join with heaven's choir, just celebrating the fact that he lives. See the tomb. Come on, we sing it. See the tomb where he lay. See the stone roll away. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. We see his hand. See his hands. See his feet. Touch his scars. has many parts but the many parts make up one whole body so it is with the body of Christ some of us are Jews some are Gentiles and some are slaves and some are free but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit
Come on, church, let's just come together right now to worship. And people come together, strange as neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generation, of every nation, of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high and fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our hell comes from. Oh, you hear Let the praise go up. 
His kingdom come. Hey, Westridge, I'm here with Reva Burks, who is the executive director here at Helping Hands. Helping Hands has been around since 1987. It's a Christian organization that serves food and other items to people who just need help in our community. Reva, I know that we, we talked yesterday about the pandemic and how this has put an, a, a huge additional burden on your organization. Can you tell me exactly how the pandemic has affected you guys? So um, we're still operating five days a week, but we're only distributing food three days a week. I would say, just to break it down in a, a daily number, we went from, say, 40 people a day to anywhere between 80 and 120 people a day. It has, I mean, new people in the area, they've lost their jobs, you know, they're no longer working, and they still have, you know, mortgage and rent and, and utilities to pay. So it's not enough money left for food. So Absolutely. that's exactly what we're here for. Come when you need to. Yeah. Tell me why do you do this? Why, why do you, why is this so important to you personally? I do this because God has called me here. This is my personal calling. And, and I found out once I got here, it's not just about food. It's about everybody's spirituality and, and coming to know God. So they come in here and they come in these doors. We have devotion in the morning, you know, so if they never heard of them, they will when they come here. I love it. Mm -hmm. So you're not only meeting their physical needs, mm -hmm. but you're also meet, meeting their spiritual needs as well. Yes. So as a church, we wanted to come alongside you in two different ways. We wanted to, number one, we wanted to pray for Helping Hands and pray that God will continue to meet the needs of our of this of this organization, not just only from a volunteer stand, standpoint, but also financially. And number two, we wanted to help you financially. And, and I know the needs are great. And I know you every day you wonder how God is gonna provide. And I wanted to be able to, on behalf of Wetridge Church, provide you a check for $5,000 for helping Ooh, hands. Thank you. So thank we just you. wanna say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank We're so honored to do this. Thank you for what you're Thank doing. You. Well, we hope it's helpful, and yes, uh, we just absolutely. hope that we can continue to come alongside you yes. and help in any way that, yes. we, that, that we can do that. And mm -hmm. we're just so proud of what you're doing here and just Thank proud you. of the fact that you are pointing people to Jesus yeah. every day by being his hands and his feet. So. Thank, Thank you. So you. We appreciate you. All right. Mm, we appreciate you, you. So how about a good appreciate elbow you. bump? Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. No, thank you. Goodness. Thank you, Westridge. Westridge, what a story of generosity. God is good. And you know what? We as his church get to reflect that part of his generous heart by saying yes again and again to the things that he is asking of us individually, us as a Westridge church. And I hope you heard this one line in that video that I just can't shake. Miss Reva shared with Kevin. She said, when people come here, they may not know about who he is. You know, it's not just about food. She said, when, he, when people come here, they're gonna leave and they're gonna know not only of who he is, but what he has done. And here at Westridge, one thing that we know for sure, time and time again, is that when we have an opportunity to come alongside a physical need, God always makes a way for us to have an avenue to the spiritual, the physical and the spiritual come together in that way. And so us as a church right now, we're gonna keep pressing in, leading in, listening up to what God is doing. I know right now it feels a little different that we're not physically meeting at Westridge Church, this building, but we are all out there. And I want you to know deep in your heart, the truth that God, he is the same yesterday, today and forever, and He is with us. And God has laid on our hearts leaders, the, the hearts of our leaders, some values, one of those being generosity. And that has not changed even in the midst of what is going on currently. So church, let's get on board. Let's keep saying yes to the things that God is doing even right now. And in this moment, you're in your living room, you're in your kitchen, finishing up breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever time of the day it is. Come together and let's have this moment. Let's lean in. Let's 
step in and together as a family, let's give this moment to God. And as we do, I want you to know there are three really easy ways to give. One of those ways is through our website, westridge.com give. Secondly, our app. And third, if you would still like to send a check to our physical address here at Westridge, you can also do that. Well, let's gather up right where we are at and let's give this moment to God through prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, I thank you for what you are doing even in the midst of what's currently going on in our world. God, we see you here. You have much for us to do. And you are asking this church, Westridge Church, to continue that generosity even now. God, will you show us what obedience for us personally looks like and what obedience for us as Westridge Church looks like. We love you, we trust you, and we know that you are here with us. In your name we pray, amen.
Great job this morning. Thank you to our uh, worship team who continues to bring it every single weekend throughout this pandemic and even before, and they will continue to do so. I love our crew up here and so grateful for all of them. And uh, I want to just take a moment and welcome you from all over Georgia, all over Atlanta, all over the United States, and literally all over the world. It's so good to have you today at Westridge Church, and uh, I'm excited about this series that we are currently in, the series uh, called Narrative over the last few weeks, and in the weeks to come, we're going to be continuing to expose the lies and the stories that have shaped our thoughts and our emotions and our behaviors, and we're going to replace these stories with the truth of God's narrative. We're going to replace them with God's truth, because John chapter 8, verse 32 says that when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Now, I want to start today off by telling you just a little story. Um, As most of you know, when I was growing up, for my first 15 years of my life, I lived in a little city outside of Detroit, Redford Township, Michigan. And I lived there from 1969 to 1980, all the way till I was about 15 years old. And the neighborhood I lived in, every house was pretty much the same. Most everyone's dad worked in some capacity in the auto industry, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, blue-collar families. My dad owned a a little family flower shop, and uh, he was also a draftsman for several uh, organizations, one time for Ford, Massey Ferguson. And I never really thought much about whether or not my family had money or whether they didn't. But in 1980, um, before my 10th grade year, my dad uh, surrendered to ministry. And so my family moved from from outside of Detroit, Michigan, to Arlington, Texas, so my dad could go to Bible college. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I was an outsider. I had moved from the north to not just the south, but to the state of Texas. And I had a strong northern accent. My, my parents didn't make a lot of money. We didn't live in a big house, didn't drive, you know, nice fancy cars. Um, and for the first time in my life, this young 15-year-old who was very much still an, uh, an extrovert, who, who had grown up with some very close, intimate friendships, I really struggled to fit in. I struggled to find close friendships. I struggled to find community. And all of this led my mind to believe a couple of narratives that really were not true. And here was the big lie that I believed, that if people really knew me, they wouldn't really like me. If people really knew me, they really wouldn't like me. Now that lie can lead to another lie that says, well, you know what, therefore I can can do life on my own or I can solve all my problems on my own. So while eventually I had, you know, I had a lot of friends in high school, I, I, I kept everyone at what I would say was pretty much a safe distance so that if they really, really knew me, then I wouldn't have to deal with the idea that they maybe really wouldn't like me. 
because again, the lie was that if I, I believe that if you really, really got to know, know me, then, then you might not accept me or you might reject me. Therefore, I've got this. I can solve all of my problems on my own. I can deal with all of my issues on my own. And I'll do that just by kind of keeping everybody at a safe distance. Now, I mentioned a few weeks ago that Satan's an opportunist, okay? And when he sees an opportunity, he will step in and he will build what the Bible describes as a stronghold. Author and Pastor Tony Evans says, a stronghold is a mindset that accepts a situation or a behavior as unchangeable even though that situation is contrary to the will and the word of God. Now, fortunately, God began to break down that stronghold in my life through my college years, and really I felt like I was getting victory over it during my senior year of college. But even to this day, that lie will still creep into my mind, especially when I'm around a lot of people that either I don't feel comfortable with or a lot of people that I don't really know. Psychiatrist Kurt Thompson, who specializes on everything related to the brain, says that no matter how strong someone looks on the outside, every person walking the planet has this deeply embedded fear that haunts them day by day. Thank you. Even if, even if uh, you really knew me, the fear whispers, you'd leave me. Even if someone really, really knew me, the fear whispers, they would leave me. And ultimately, this is the lie of shame. This is the lie that shatters your self-worth, the lie that reminds you over and over of the real you that you really don't want others to see. Author Jenny Allen in her book, Get Out of Your Head, says that oftentimes when we struggle with this lie, here are some of the narratives that play out in our mind. If people really knew what I've done, they'd want nothing to do with me. If people saw who I really am, mm, they'd run the other way. If people knew the thoughts that I'm capable of thinking, they would actually evict me out of their life. Or maybe this narrative speaks a more subtle lie over your life. Why would I ever want to bother people with my problems? Or people don't care about what I'm going through. Or nobody really gets me. Or what good will it do if I let someone in anyways? And it's the same lie that speaks the words never enough over your life, never good enough, never powerful enough, never thin enough, never successful enough, never certain enough, never safe enough. And it's all rooted in shame. And eventually this narrative of shame creates this false idea inside of us that says, I can solve my own problems by myself. I, I can do life on my own. If I just keep people right out here, then I will be okay, which turns into this behavior that causes us to build walls and to hold people at a distance to avoid risking exposure or rejection. And here's the consequence of allowing a lie like that to become a reality or a stronghold in our life. Loneliness. And loneliness has been linked to heart disease. It's been linked to depression and chronic stress and even poor sleep. Well, this morning, I want to replace all of these lies and false narratives with this one truth. And here's the truth. We were created to live known and to live loved. We were created to live known and to live loved. Our bodies are hardwired for connection with other people. Think about this for a moment. Jesus himself modeled throughout his life this, this idea that it, was, that it was better to do life with other people than to do it alone. He did life with 12 men. He was extremely close with three of them, and one of them he called his beloved. We are created to live known, and we are created to live love. We were not made to celebrate victory alone. We weren't made to suffer and to be in grief alone. We weren't made to walk through life alone. We weren't made to be alone trapped in our thoughts and our emotions. We weren't made to, to, do, to do life on video screens. We were not created for all of our deepest thoughts and the cries of our hearts to be shared through text and through emails. We were made to be connected to one another, to be known by one another, and to be loved by one another. Now, some of you may be wondering, Brian, are you ever going to open a Bible in this sermon? I actually, I'm going to do it right now. And if you have a Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Colossians. In the book of Colossians, the apostle Paul is writing to this small little church in modern day Turkey about the preeminence and the supremacy of Jesus. And I want to sum up pretty much everything Paul is saying in this book in three words. Here it is. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. 
And he gets, when we get into chapter three, he begins to teach the, the, this church about how this idea of Jesus being preeminent over every area of our lives should impact our minds. Not only our minds, but our thoughts and our emotions. And he says in verse one, he, in verse one, he says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. And he says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And here's what Paul's saying. He says, our minds will determine our well-being. Well, if our minds are, are going to be healthy, then we have to, to, then they have to be focused in the right place and they have to be focused on the right person. In other words, we have to focus our minds on Jesus and on his perspective about our lives and our world instead of the things that are not of this world. And then he reminds this church that when they put their faith and trust in Jesus to be their personal Lord and Savior, God gave them a new identity to help them to be able to develop a new mentality, a new mindset. Here's how he describes it. He says this, he says, your life has been hidden with Christ in God. In other words, because of Jesus, we have become known and we have become loved by God the Father. The creator, the God of the universe, the one who holds the world and everything else in his hands, not only does he know you personally, but he loves you. And I want to add this one thought to that phrase. Not only does he love you, but he likes you. And that's the truth. That's the narrative that God wants to speak over your life today. God the Father, he knows you, he sees you, he loves you, and he actually likes you. And so the Apostle Paul says, listen, put away your old identity, put away your old thoughts and this old mentality about who you used to be before God gave you this new identity in Christ and embrace the truth. Because of Jesus, you are known and you are loved. And then Paul gets into verses 10 through 14 and he begins to instruct these new Christ followers on how to live from this new identity, from this new mentality, this truth about how to be known and how to be loved by the Father. He says in order to live in this truth and to live this truth out so it actually impacts other people around us, we have some choices to make. And he says the first choice we have to make is that we have to choose community. We have to choose to live in community. Here's the truth. God has hardwired us to be connected to one another. We were created not to just be known and to be loved by God the Father. We were created to be known and loved by other people. God created us to belong to a family, to belong to a tribe, to belong to a group, to have a squad, to have a posse. We, we need other people in our lives. Let me take you back to just for a moment to my high school years, okay? Back when I had a whole lot more hair. Even though, you know, if somebody knew me back in high school, they, they would say, Brian, you played baseball, you played football, you were in the band, you were, you were in, a, in a really good youth group, in a great church. But here's the deal. I did not feel like I had a close community of friends that truly knew me and loved the real me. And truth be told, I was lonely. If my high school friends heard me talking right now and some of them may be hearing me talk right now, they might say, listen, wait a minute. You, you, were, you were pretty popular. You, you joked around. You seemed like you were having a lot of fun. You, were, you, you seemed like you were really happy. And I would go, yeah, on the outside. But inside, I was lonely. Matter of fact, for a few months during my freshman year in college, I battled with depression. You say, why? Remember the lie that I believed? I believe this lie that if you really knew me, you wouldn't really like me. So I can do this all on my own. I, I really don't need to let anybody else get really, really close to me. I can solve all of my own problems. I've got this. And here's the truth. God wants us in close community with one another because we're better together. We're better when we have close, intimate relationships with friends who can help us battle through those lies and those false narratives that, that Satan wants to speak over to our lives, that we allow those things to become truth into our minds. Here's what author Jenny Allen says. She says, we need to be able to seek out wisdom and insight when our own brains can't sort out the answers, can't muster the willpower, can't find the truth, can't remember how to pray. Relationships like that take time and effort and energy to cultivate, but they shift everything. This is one of the biggest reasons why we do groups and believe in groups so strongly here at Westridge Church. It's, it's why we're working so hard, even right now, to encourage you to be in a group. 
because we're better together. We were created for community. But in order to experience community, you have to choose it. You have to allow other people to come in. You have to let them into the places where you might feel the most vulnerable. Now, Paul mentions a couple things that will break down community in our lives in the, in the upcoming verses. And he says, listen, this will not only break down community in your life, but it'll break down community in the church every single time. He says in verse 10, he says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Now, Paul would, why, why would Paul mention lying? I mean, out of, of all the things you could mention at this moment, why would he mention lying? Paul says, do not lie to another. Why? Because, here's why. Because lying destroys relationships. Lying breaks down trust between people. It tears apart true, true, true biblical community. And then he says this in verse 11. He says, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, what does that verse have to do with community? Well, Paul says, listen, if, if, if you want to experience true biblical, biblical community, not just in your life, but in the church, then you have to embrace a life where you are truly known and where you are seen and where you are loved. And when that happens, he says, you have to tear down barriers in your life. In order for that to happen, you have to tear down some racial barriers and some cultural barriers and some social barriers and even some educational barriers. Why? Well, listen, if we, if we only allow ourselves to be, to, to be close to those who look like us and think like us, just think on how, just think on how much we're really missing out on. Think of, of how much of God's creation we are actually limiting ourselves to. Paul says Christ is, is, is all and he is in all. That means that Christ took our differences and our prejudices and, and the sinful barriers that keep us from really knowing each other and loving one another and he overruled them and he destroyed them on the cross. And Paul says part of embracing our new identity and, 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 our, and our new mindset, uh, mindset in Christ is to open our lives up to people who are different than us, people of a different skin color, people of different background, people of different cultures. He says if we're going to really live to be known and live to be loved, we have to choose community and we have to continue to put everything aside that is going to break it down and to, and to destroy it. If we're going to experience a community as a church, then we have to tear down all of those barriers. And then he says we also have to, if we're going to experience, really, really live known and really live to be, to be loved, he says we have to choose to extend grace. In verse 12 he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive and then he says and above all these things put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony Paul says as God's children we have been chosen to be holy and loved and that's grace okay grace is when God extends favor to those that don't deserve it and so since we don't deserve grace Paul says we have been called to extend grace to one another now Listen to the words that Paul uses to describe how we are to extend grace. He uses the word compassion. He uses the word kindness. He uses the word um, humility. He uses the word meekness, which means gentleness. He uses the words patience. He talks about bearing with one another, qu being quick to forgive. And then he tells us, he says, you got to put on love. Those are the behaviors. Those are the attitudes of biblical community. That's how we live out the truth that we are known and that we are loved. We extend grace to one another. Because where there is true biblical community, you will always find people extending grace to one another. And then here's what Paul says here. He says we have to choose to be vulnerable. We have to be, choose to be vulnerable. Now I'm going to be honest with you. When I started off this sermon, I purposefully chose to tell a story about myself that I have never told before. And, I'm gonna, and I, to be really vulnerable, I wrestled all week long about whether or not I should tell that story. Now you say, why would you wrestle with that? Well, because it exposes a part of my life that I would rather not talk about. It exposes a part of my life that, quite honestly, when I, when I tell it, it's, it's embarrassing. It makes me feel kind of weak. But it's a lie that I believed for years when I was younger, and all that was rooted in shame. 
And sharing that story actually makes me vulnerable. But I love the way Brene Brown, who is a specialist on the issue of vulnerability and shame, she talks, she says, the definition of vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. She says vulnerability is at the core, the heart, the center of meaningful human experiences. Or to put it another way, we must be known in order to be healthy. See, if I'm going to live in the truth that I am known and I am loved, I have to be vulnerable in three areas of my life. First of all, I have to be vulnerable with God. I have to be willing to be open and honest with God about my fears and my shame and my struggles and and, and my sins if he is going to continue to do an inner work in my life. And Paul tells us to put off the old self and to put on the new self. He says, put off your old identity and embrace your new one. Listen, the only way that I can do that is by having an open, honest, vulnerable connection to God through the power of the Holy Spirit. I have to be willing to allow God to do an inner work on the inside, an inner work inside of me. Because without that, listen, he can't lead me to then be vulnerable with one another. Now, this is a tough one. I mean, one of the downfalls of of being part of a large church is that you can attend every single week and never get to know anyone at depth. Listen, you can hide. You can self-isolate even when there's not a mandate to to self-isolate. But choosing to be vulnerable with one another allows you to be known. It allows you to be cared for. It allows you to be accepted. It allows you to be challenged and encouraged and to be truly loved, to experience true community the way God wired you to experience it. But in order to do that, you also have to be vulnerable in a third area. You have to be vulnerable to risk and failure. That's a, that's a risk to throw yourself out there to be truly known and be loved by other people. It's a risk to, to, to be open to share your heart and your feelings with God and with other people. And here's a question that may be going through your mind. Well, what, what, what if they really did get to know me and they really didn't like me? What if they actually did reject me? I want you to think about Jesus for just a moment. Think about how many times he threw his heart out there only to be rejected. He was was rejected by his friends. He was rejected by his own people. Luke chapter 17 tells us he healed 10 lepers and only one of them said thank you. The religious community turned against him. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends. Very few of his friends actually showed up at the cross. And yet he was so committed to his mission to reconcile the lost and and, and, and people who are lost to his father that it cost him his life. But listen, praise God that he made himself vulnerable to risk and failure because his sacrifice on the cross made it possible for us to be accepted and to be seen and to be known and to be loved by his father. It would have been much easier for Jesus to have taken the safe route, to to have never thrown his heart out there by coming to earth to walk amongst us, to die for our sins. But instead, instead he chose vulnerability. And I love what, again, Brene Brown says. She says, vulnerability is not weakness. It's our most accurate measure of courage. Listen, if we are truly going to live in truth and live out the truth of being known and loved, we have to courageously choose community. We have to choose to extend grace to one another. And then we have to choose vulnerability. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, Brian, I'm not sure I can do that. Because at the end of the day, what if I still don't feel enough? What if I don't feel like I'm enough? What if I still get rejected? What if if I still somehow or another, after throwing myself out there, what if I still feel like I don't measure up? What What if my big fear came true? What if you really knew me? I opened my heart up to you and you really got to know me and you didn't like me. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 have been game changers for me throughout my life. Here's what it says. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Paul says, because of Jesus, you are complete. Nothing else needs to be added. If someone else gets to know you, the real you, and they choose not to like you or accept you or to even love you, listen, it's okay. 
because Jesus is enough. And because of Jesus, you are enough. And because of Jesus and the fact that you're enough, listen, you can choose community. You can choose to extend grace to other people. You can, ex- you can choose to, to be vulnerable, to be vulnerable with God, to be vulnerable with other people, to be vulnerable to, to risk and, and failure. Because I want you to know that because of Jesus, you are completely known and you are completely loved. I want you to bow your head for just a moment, wherever you are, sitting in your living room, sitting by yourself at a desk, driving in your car, keep your eyes open for just a moment, if you would. But just think about this for a moment and pray with me. Lord, I thank you that because of Jesus, I'm complete. Because of Jesus and knowing him personally and experiencing salvation, we are complete in our relationship with you. All of the fullness of the deity of God lives inside of Jesus. And because we are in Christ, hidden in Christ, and he is in us, Lord, we are complete as well. That means nothing needs to be added. We are enough because Jesus is enough. And Lord, I thank you for the truth of the fact that we are known and we are loved by the Father. Lord, it just changes the narrative for so many of us. It allows us to know, Lord, that it's okay for us to choose community. We can risk, Lord, sitting in a, in a room with other people. We can open up our hearts. We can share our deepest thoughts and our emotions, Lord. We can throw ourselves out there knowing that you're enough inside of us, Lord, knowing that we're fully known and fully, fully loved. Lord, we can extend grace to other people. We can accept other people into our lives, Lord, that are different than us, that think different than us. We don't have to be, to be uh, we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to put up barriers. We don't have to lie about ourselves, Lord. We don't have to mask the truth. We don't have to hold people at arm's length. We can let people in. We can let others draw close to us, Lord. Because of Jesus, we can be vulnerable. We can open up our hearts to you, Lord. One of the most vulnerable things to do is to admit that without you, we have nothing. That without you, we are lost. That without you, Lord, we, will, we really can't make it through this life the way you want us to live, Lord, without purpose and meaning. And ultimately, we can't make it into the next life, into heaven. It's vulnerable to be at a place like that. And so, Lord, my prayer right now is with all the vulnerability that, that someone can muster up, that they will open their heart up to you at this very moment. They will humble themselves and they will come to you and they will ask you to be their personal savior. And if that's where you are right now, I'm gonna ask you to humbly bow your heart before the Lord, to be vulnerable before him and to say something like this, Lord Jesus, at this very moment, I vulnerably come before you. I open my heart up to you. And Lord, I confess to you that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I need forgiveness in my life, Lord. Lord, I wanna experience community with you in a way that I've never experienced it before. You're extending grace to me right now that I don't deserve. And Lord, you vulnerably allowed your son to come to earth so that he could vulnerably live his life out. Not in weakness, but in courage to give his life for me. And so I put all of my faith and all of my trust in Jesus alone. And I ask him to be my Lord and my personal savior. Everything that he did for me on the cross was enough. I cannot get through this life or into the next life without him. So it's all about Jesus. And I put my faith and my trust in Jesus right now. I believe that he was the son of God, the savior of the world. And I ask him to forgive me my sins.